and thank you for joining us for today's session, which is the second webinar in a three part series introducing commercial property law. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by Ian Quayle and my colleague Robert Kelly. Thanks, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yes, once again, I'm delighted to be working with my colleagues at Stuart Title. And just before we start, you know, they are sponsoring these events, and Stuart Title are a great company. Uh, and therefore, if you do have any requirements, or if you're dealing with transactions on either side or thinking about indemnity policies, Stephen, Robert, and their colleagues are always at hand to provide assistance, whether it's a bespoke policy or one of their standard policies. Do have a look at their website because, as I said, so they are assisting the legal profession in organising training events such as this, and it's nice to be able to support sponsors wherever possible. So a massive thank you to them, and a massive thank you to you uh, today as well. We are recording today's session. If you want a copy of the recording, then uh, Stephen and Robert can ensure that you get a copy or a copy is made available to you. If you have any questions or queries, we'll try and deal with them during the session but I'm also happy to take emails or any questions that you have and we'll endeavour to assist them. So we're covering a myriad of different topics, so we're going to have to skip through quite a lot today, so do bear with me. Stephen mentions there are extensive notes that accompany the presentation. The idea of the presentation is just to sort of highlight some key issues. So what we're going to be talking about are some issues relating to property joint ventures. We're going to have a look at some issues relating to options and overage. We'll talk about some other issues too if we've got time. The first thing to talk about, of course, are valuable websites to the list on slide there. Do have a look at all of those slides, uh, all of those sites. They do provide information for you that will be useful. The first three are free of charge. The last one is a subscription service, but they do contain a wealth of material. In particular, City of London Law Society's Land Law Committee is a brilliant site for getting precedents getting advice about electronic signatures, looking at protocols, systems, etc., for modern commercial property law. PLA website, again, similar and property protocols worth looking at as well. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to be talking about today are property joint ventures. And over the years, I've done lots and lots of JV work, uh, some of it on behalf of local authorities, some of it on behalf of... Um, uh, companies and organizations, whether it's the joint venture vehicle or uh, participants in the joint venture, or sometimes to my uh, uh, to my sort of chagrin, both um, important to understand, I think, how joint structures are formulated, the sort of ethos sitting behind them, looking at some due diligence. We won't have time to look at tax and SDLT issues or some of the issues relating to due diligence. There is a bit of case law to look at again if we've got time. So when we're dealing with joint ventures, I think the first thing, if I'm a local authority lawyer, is just to take instructions from my estates team to see just what we're doing. The JV might be a sort of pure JV where we're putting land into the transaction, putting funding into the transaction and supervising the development. On the other hand, it might be a joint venture where we're simply putting land in and someone else is taking risk. It might be that we're putting funding. It might be a, a funding in. It might be a site assembly project. So we need to know just what the joint venture is about before we can decide what sort of structure is, is appropriate. So taking instructions is important. Then being aware of the variety of different structures that are available to us. Important to understand that it's not just creating an SPV, a special purpose vehicle company, and that is the joint venture vehicle. We do need to think that there are lots of other sort of structures, lots of other methods of dealing with JVs. Key considerations, what's our objective? What are we proposing to do? What's the business plan? Who are our joint venture participants? What's our end game? Are we looking at um, the potential for the JV failing? What happens if we want to exit the JV during its life or other participants want to as well? As a local authority, we've got to realize, one, that we ain't going anywhere. I've dealt with joint ventures in the past, particularly with sort of international participants, and they couldn't care less about their standing in the UK. And therefore, if a joint venture failed, if they needed to exit the JV, there was no sort of collateral damage done to them, but a lot of potential collateral damage done to UK businesses and organisations that would still have to sort of survive the aftermath notwithstanding the failure of this JV. So you need to think about that. As far as drafting is concerned, when I say problems with wording, 
as property lawyers, and Robert Kelly from Stuart Title was a property lawyer, so was I, um, you try to sort of draft for everything. You try to consider every possible eventuality. And with joint ventures, frequently what you've got is a sort of a meeting of the tides. You've got our commercial lawyers, and a joint venture for a commercial lawyer is the creation of documentation to create a structure for dealing with decision making, and they don't and can't draft for every possible eventuality. Whereas a property lawyer, I want to try and do that. So one of the things you'll see with joint venture structures is the idea that there's a, a degree of flexibility, a framework that's created to enable decisions to be taken, and then systems and processes that come into play where decisions can't be reached or decisions need to be taken. So when you're creating a joint venture structure, when you're creating joint venture documentation, you need to be aware of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is particularly where you're dealing with large scale JVs, that what you're doing is not drafting for every eventuality, you are considering the idea of the creation of a framework. So if there is a problem, if there is an issue, we've got documentation that deals with it. And it's funny, I was talking to someone yesterday. I used to deal with a client of mine whose attitude to business was pretty unique, to be honest with you. We bought and sold companies, we bought and sold businesses, and frequently there was no documentation whatsoever. His attitude was, I'm a man of my word, if I shake on a deal, I'll do the deal, and I expect the people that I do business with to have the same attitude. If something goes wrong with a deal, then you know I'm not going to be interested in going to court or being taken to court. I'm going to try and sort it out. So I don't really need a lawyer to sort of draft documentation to protect me. I'm big enough and old enough was his were his words that uh, you know I've just about seen anything and everything that could happen, and I'm prepared to deal with consequences. So to an extent, although not quite that sort of cavalier attitude, it is important to understand that some people do have a different attitude to JVs, particularly where you've got sort of joint ventures relating to property development. We can just have a look at the next slide. So what we're doing with documentation is creating a framework um, for dealing with decision making, or we're deliberately not doing so, as I'm going to show you in a moment or two. There are some things that are so potentially dreadful that in not drafting or dealing with it, we hope that the parties realise that it's in everyone's interest to come to some arrangement or to do something rather than allow the JV to sort of fold or to allow the, um, the JV to stall or something of that nature. So our documentation really is a tool for decision making, a framework that enables the parties to work together, a classification of obligations with authority to impose solutions where problems arise. I always maintain, and I've always maintained, that when dealing with JVs, and I don't care whether you're a local authority or you're a private organisation, I would like my estate department, I would like my client to produce a business plan. Ideally, a business plan that's agreed with all joint venture participants so we know pre precisely the direction of travel. So we can create this framework, we can create these tools, we can classify obligations, we can think about solutions to commonly encountered problems. Now, I'll show you in a moment or two the different types of vehicle that we could use. But at this moment in time, what I want to explain to you with regard to a JV is that at the start of the joint venture, there's some decisions to be made. And one of the important decisions is, if our local authority is a participant, if we've got a local landowner that's a participant, if we've got a developer that's a participant, who's going to advise the joint venture entity, either the special purpose vehicle or whatever entity we're going to create that's going to actually do the joint venture? Because it's dangerous if we're advising a local authority that we're also perceived as being advising the joint venture vehicle. And the same would apply to other lawyers and advisors dealing with other joint venture participants. In my view, it is always better if we're creating a special purpose vehicle, a company for the JV, that that company has independent representation. On the issue of participants, there are a number of points that I want to explain to you. When we're looking at a JV, sometimes we need to think about key participants. 
And I've got a great example to share with you with regard to key participation. One of the residential house builders that I've worked for over the years, and still do a little bit of consultancy work for from time to time, was once involved in the acquisition of a heavily contaminated site. I was told it was one of the most contaminated sites in Northern Europe. Uh, it had been used in the past as a coke works and the byproduct of the production of coke from coal are some fairly nasty chemicals. These chemicals had leaked into the ground, they'd remained in the ground because the ground was predominantly clay based and there was a sort of basin of clay that meant all these contaminants were still in situ in the site. Big site, uh, former coke works had been demolished many years ago. It had been laid to grass and woodland on the basis that no one really wanted to touch it or do anything with it. So what we had was a local authority that was keen on this site being developed and reclaimed and made safe. We had a house builder that was buying the site for a nominal consideration of a pound. There was a great deal of decontamination work that was needed to be done. And the developer had found a company that was willing to deal with the decontamination for a share of the development value of the site once it had been cleansed. A joint venture vehicle was created, a limited company was created, the land was placed into the name of that company the developer, the local authority, and the decontaminator all had shares in the company. But the issue was, between the local authority and the developer, if our decontaminator gets cold feet, gets into financial difficulties, or has a problem with regard to the transaction and bails out, what do we do? can we continue with the JV without them? Answer no. Is there anyone with the financial resources that could stand in their shoes that have the expertise to decontaminate? Answer no. So what we ended up doing was um, requiring to, to pay a bond so that if anything happened with regard to that contaminator, we had sufficient funds to get someone else in to finish the job. Sometimes a key participant might be a landowner, sometimes it might be your local authority, in which case we do need to think about, in our framework, in our documentation, thinking about doomsday scenarios. In addition to that, we need to think about non-participants that are going to be required in connection with the project. So are there contractors that we're going to engage? Can we agree a list of contractors that we're going to utilise? Are there people that we want to avoid. So we know that developer A and developer B in the past have used such a firm of contractors as a local authority or county council, we don't want them to be involved. We might want a right of veto as to who's going to be doing work on the site, even where we're not actually going to be involved in the development directly. SPVs are very useful. Of course, special purpose vehicles are very useful, but again, we need to think about what sort of company we're going to do, we'll create, who are going to be directors of that company, what is their role. We also think need to think about the idea of the appointment of nominees. Sometimes there'll be nominee directors, nominee participants. Are we going to allow that? If we're contracting with XYZ Limited as a developer or a landowner, we're probably not going to want them to be able to nominate nominees with regard to the joint venture or with regard to any aspect of it. As we'll see in a moment or two, rather than using an SPV, rather than using a limited company as our joint venture vehicle, we might think about other ways, more innovative ways of dealing with joint ventures. And I've used limited partnership agreements, general partnership agreements, um, co-ownership agreements for certain types of JV that have worked perfectly well. It, with regard to the use of general partnerships or with regard to co-ownership agreements, I've had situations where the participants are worried about publicity. They don't want the world at large to know about their involvement. There are commercially sensitive aspects of the transaction and therefore the use of a general partnership or a co-ownership agreement has worked fine. So I wouldn't dismiss other ways of dealing with JVs apart from limited companies as special purpose vehicles. I mentioned to 
be careful about overseas participants was what I once caught out many years ago with a, a, a JV and what we had was a Japanese developer and bank that were looking at funding quite a large JV and as I say this JV didn't get off the ground to be honest with you much to the concern of my developer client because it had a good reputation in the UK still has and uh, it was worried about the adverse publicity of this JV failing as a consequence of the Japanese entities sort of pulling out right at the last minute so sometimes as I mentioned where we have overseas participants we need to be careful and cautious about tying them in as early as possible and ensuring that we are protected in the event of JV failure and then finally on slide here I mentioned something that I think is a particular concern for local authorities over the years I've acted for people who have uh, suggested that they are property developers who have attempted to impress everyone and uh, anyone with regard to their wealth their assets etc their borrowing ability and in fact they've been sort of men of straw um, remember in particular very early on in my sort of commercial property career acting on behalf of three guys that would go around the countryside entering into option agreements and endeavoring to impress landowners including local authorities about their skills and abilities relating to development what they then do is enter into an option agreement as far as that option agreement was concerned they had no intention of ever exercising the option what they would do is sell the option on to i think there were three house builders that they were dealing with and they would take in essence a commission out of the um, option agreement that was being um, exchanged or the option agreement was being transferred to builders so sometimes with a jv you'll have someone entering into a joint venture and the aim will be to sort of develop a position to get a hold over a piece of land over a development and then extract themselves and sell to someone else and uh, i have known some reg regional house builders that will create sort of phoenix organizations for precisely that purpose if you're a local authority or a private landowner and you know one of the national house builders wants to buy some land off you then because they are a national house builder with a big checkbook you might start thinking to yourself well we know what market value is but let's get market value plus the idea of some of these phoenix organizations is that they are in essence funded by a major land uh, a major builder or a national house builder but the reality is that they will be appear to be a relatively small fly developer with little or no reputation with little or no uh, financial resources sitting behind them meaning that the landowner or local authority is less greedy with regard to the deal or the transaction but the whole purpose of the transaction is that there is an ability to assign the benefit of the transaction to someone else and then surprise surprise once the deals are done documents are signed the benefit of the jv the benefit of the transaction the option agreement or whatever it is is immediately assigned to a national house builder who says thanks very much now sometimes it's far better to be deal with uh, dealing with a national organization than a minnow developer that's really a man or a woman a straw but do watch out for that as i say i've seen jvs and the whole issue has been can we as an organization get um a position with regard to a parcel of land can we then extract ourselves from that jv at a handsome profit to move on to the next one so there's no plan to stay with the jv for the life of the joint venture the next thing we need to think about when we're talking about jvs particularly from a local authority perspective is the following decision makers as I said, the idea of using a joint venture or creating a joint venture is to have a framework for decision making. And what you'll have is strategic decisions taken by the joint venture board. The board will then have beneath it an executive whose role is to implement the decision of the board and act as a go between to, between the board and those that are directly involved in the scheme itself. You'll then have project managers who could be ex employed within the joint venture vehicle or could be external. Uh, and the idea of project managers is to drive the deal, drive the JV forward. And when I talk about driving the JV forward, there has to be an end game. 
That's why I want a business plan. That's why I want to know about objectives, not just the objectives of my local authority or county council, but the objectives of everyone else. They should be written down and disclosed to all other parties so that we can see precisely what their intentions are, just as they can see precisely what our intentions are too. Going forward from that, as far as the decision-making process is concerned, I've mentioned that what we're looking at is the creation of a framework. If we're creating an SPV, what we will have, of course, is a memorandum and articles of association and probably a shareholders agreement. The shareholders agreement really will be the key in connection with decision-making and the decision-making process. But what we have is a framework for decision-making examples of the sorts of decisions that are taken by different organizations or entities within the JV, a requirement for decision making to be unanimous or having some form of special majority or simple majority depending on what the decision is and what the issues are and documents are drafted to cover situations and to provide examples of the sorts of decisions that are taken by different organizations, entities or individuals within the JV. The documentation should state objectives and should contain disputes for dispute resolution. And we should always be thinking about the wider picture. How will this look if this fails? How does this look if it succeeds? And if you're a local authority, the issue about uh, how it looks, it can be radically different to how it looks for a profit-making organization or a private company or a private individual. So always consider issues such as adverse publicity. Uh, favorable publicity for one organization might not necessarily be favorable position for, uh, uh, favorable publicity for you. Again, we need to determine the objectives of a joint venture. What are we doing? Are we looking at generating income? Are we looking at capital growth? Do we as a local authority have PFI objectives? That latter point, again, is particularly important. We might have other joint venture participants who are not remotely interested in PFI type of, uh, initiatives in sort of social well-being or in ideas other than sort of generating a return. If we are looking at returns, are we looking at income? Are we looking at exit strategies and uh, sort of cashing in on the joint venture at some point? If so, what is that point? When do we start thinking about getting out and how do we divide up the booty that we obtain as a consequence? When we're looking at starting a joint venture, I think there are some important points. Point number one, there's case law that I can show you that reveals that where you are talking about creating a JV, there is a danger that the JV starts when you're talking about it. So if you are looking at negotiating the start of a JV, I think it's important to think about listing what preconditions are necessary before the joint venture goes live and what happens when it does go live. So there's no liability, no commitment on anyone until the joint venture actually becomes active and we're agreeing a start date and looking at preconditions. Preconditions might involve issues relating to funding of the joint venture, looking at who's gonna be advising the joint venture vehicle, who are the consultants and advisors to the JV and what does the JV hope to achieve. We've talked already about decision making and I think it's important that we think about management control and we categorize as soon as we can the decisions that the joint venture is going to have to take and we allocate responsibility for who's going to take those decisions. We need to think about how many participants the joint venture they're going to be, what size of stake they've got and what sort of uh, involvement in decision making does each of the participants have. So we might have a situation where you as a local authority are putting land in. Someone else is also putting in some land. So we're doing a sort of site assembly project. 
And then we've got a developer that's actually going to fund and actually build out the scheme. Well, in those circumstances, there may be certain aspects of decision making that you as a local authority are interested in and certain aspects that you're not. You might want an open book with regard to the joint venture vehicle so that you're fully aware of what it's doing and not doing. But that's about as far as you're interested in. You might want in the joint venture to have little or no liability with regard to the risk associated with the development itself. All of these things need addressing and considering documentation drafted and agreed before the joint venture goes live. One of the things that I think is frequently overlooked with regard to joint ventures is the issue of disposal. Can I, as a joint venture participant, extract myself from the JV during its lifetime? Are there opportunities within the JV where there is an ideal position to extract yourself? So you might have a sort of phase development. You might have a sort of review of the JV once the site assembly project is complete, once drawings, specifications, etc., are ready for the actual development itself. You might have an opportunity to review when planning is obtained, service installation has commenced, but building out hasn't. You might want uh, no one to be able to dispose of their interest in the JV until the joint venture is completed. There could be a whole lot of things that would mean that you need to manage disposal. But one of the things that I think is key is that we do have opportunities in the life of the joint venture for joint venture participants to extract themselves. That extraction should be at the time that's most opportune for the joint venture vehicle and to the joint venture participants. It shouldn't be whenever a joint venture participant simply wants out. If there is provision for disposal, how does the disposal work? Is it necessary for the interest of the joint venture participant who wants out to offer their interest to the existing joint venture participants? Or is the joint venture participant entitled to offer its interest in the JV to the market? If that's the case, is there a right of veto with regard to the remaining joint venture participants if the exiting joint venture participant finds a new participant that is to become a partner with the existing participants? Again, all this needs to be addressed. As far as joint venture documentation is concerned, let's just have a look at what we could use. Joint venture companies, shareholders agreements generally, or we might have a development agreement, or we might have a promotion agreement that's tied in to the company, the joint venture company's um, constitution. General partnerships, well, a general partnership agreement can deal with JVs. Same thing applies with limited partnership or limited liability partnerships. We can also use a co-ownership agreement to deal with joint ventures where we've got landowners that are putting land in and are also going to share development costs or where we've got someone putting land in and the other joint venture participant is also putting land in but will be carrying out the development themselves. I've also seen JVs being undertaken in connection with equity sharing leases. I don't mention this on this slide, but an equity sharing lease is quite an interesting concept. What happens if you're a local authority, you grant a lease to my client that's a developer, and your client will receive a payment up front by way of premium for the lease, but then we'll get a rental, and that rental will be dependent upon the developer building units and letting them. So you have a series of subleases. And the rent that you obtain is whatever percentage of the rent in connection with those subleases. The beauty of that is, as a local authority, you've got no risk or vulnerability with regard to the development. Developer builds out, it might be a retail park, it might be an industrial estate, it lets the units and then you get a rental, a share of the rental that the developer obtains. If the developer fails or the JV fails, then you can simply forfeit the lease. You get your land back, but hopefully you get your land back with the development, even if it's just the services that are installed or something of that nature. So that can work quite neatly and quite easily. And again, promotes privacy. 
So that's called an equity sharing lease. If we're creating a joint venture company, we could have a collaboration agreement. We could have a development agreement. We could have a shareholders agreement combined with articles of association. If that's the case, we do need to make sure that all the documentation is consistent with one another. With regard to our other vehicles, we need to have agreements and documentation. I would always have a business plan. I would always have um, a sort of development plan as to what's intended, timescales and timeframes, but they could be incorporated into all of these other structures potentially. I mentioned the need for guarantees potentially with uh, JVs if we're looking at funding from third parties. Again, whenever anyone ever talks to me about guarantees or I ever talk about guarantees, I always say a guarantee should be for a fixed amount of time and for a, a specific sum, it should have a cap or ceiling. Um, as far as leases are concerned and any other documentation that's created during the life of the JV, it's necessary that there is the, the appropriate rights of veto in favour of joint venture participants. Remember, if anyone has any questions or queries about JVs, drop me a note via email. But there are some conclusions I want to draw because I'm conscious of time. Point number one, which vehicle do you use? Well, it depends on what you want to do. SPVs are the most commonly used vehicles for joint ventures. They're the things that people tend to go to as a port of first call because that's what you do. But there are other vehicles that can be used, as I've mentioned. Who's the driving force behind the JV? Are you as a local authority the key component or the key element? in which case you can decide which vehicle is going to afford the best protection for your local authority. As far as documentation is concerned, again, you are creating a framework. You're not creating a document that covers off every eventuality. Therefore, a number of points. One, framework. How do we deal with dispute resolution? How do we deal with decision making? What happens if we wish to exit the JV? Is there a mechanism that ensures the JV is protected? What happens if there are disputes? What happens if there are participant insolvencies, etc.? All of these things need addressing and the documentation should deal with what happens where decisions are taken. Participant objective, very important. Why are we entering into this JV? And what's the objective of the vehicle? The participants must have a common objective with regard to the joint venture vehicle. I love dealing with joint ventures, to be honest with you. The reason I enjoy it is as a property lawyer, I am participating in some sort of commercial decision making. I am out of my comfort zone in that I'm probably going to have a commercial lawyer alongside giving advice about the commercial aspects of the transaction. But again, from a local authority perspective, the main driving force with regard to property joint, joint ventures is going to be by a state team. You know, what are they, what's their objective? What do they want? But my job is to think about the bigger picture. My job is to protect the local authority or my client from the other joint venture participants or the joint venture vehicle itself. Enough of that, let's talk about some other issues. Land registration, in the notes, I've given you some information about the availability of land management. And I've also given you some information about issues associated with uh, boundaries and some practical issues with dealing with uh, land registry. Just very quickly, local authorities are very vulnerable to boundary problems, be it registered land or unregistered land. And one of the things I always say to local authorities is if your estates department can highlight, be aware of, report to them the need to inspect land that is in the local authority or county council's ownership. So there should be some form of system in place for a review or inspection of land ownership. Where there is boundary sensitivity, if we're thinking about selling land, if we're thinking about entering into JVs, then there are two things that we can do. We can enter into a formal boundary agreement with neighbours, 
to agree where legal boundaries sit as between us and them, or we can make determined boundary applications to the land registry. Both are perfectly acceptable provided our neighbour agrees. If we have a situation where our neighbour does not agree where a boundary sits, then we are probably looking at some form of boundary dispute and some form of litigation. To that end, have a look at the Property Protocols website and the Boundary Dispute Protocol, which is very useful for determining how to proceed with determined boundary applications to the land registry. I repeat, a determined boundary application to the land registry, in my view, should only be made where there is agreement between landowners. If there is no agreement, the land registry will normally refer the matter to first tier tribunal for dispute resolution, and that can be a slow and expensive exercise with the potential for your local authority being vulnerable to costs. If an application is unsuccessful or an objection to an application is unsuccessful. And the other thing I make a note of here, which is a point of sort of general significance, local authorities are prone to adverse possession claims, which harks back to the point I made earlier about the estates team having uh, some form of system in place for inspecting land within the ownership of the local authority or county council. Schedule 6 of the Land Registration Act 2002 ensures that an adverse possessor who is a neighbouring landowner who encroaches onto your title has a relatively easy path with regard to claiming adverse possession. However, that neighbour must have a reasonable belief that the land that they are claiming belongs to them. So it's a fairly simple procedural thing for a neighbour to claim adverse possession but they must substantiate that they had a reasonable belief that the land that is in, within the paper title of the local authority, in fact, belongs to them. And the other good news with regard to adverse possession, if you as a local authority <coughs> lose land due to adverse possession, you have up to six years to claim the land back by way of rectification. If you can establish that the application was... Um, um, in, was uh, in some way defective or if the applicant uh, misinformed the land registry about the facts relating to their adverse possession you can apply to the land registry for rectification to get your paper title back and to get the possessory title claimed by the applicant removed as i say there'd have to be a defect in process or you'd have to be able to establish that the adverse possessor has told the land registry something about the adverse possession that isn't correct. But the point I want to labour is that all is not lost if you lose land due to adverse possession. Land registry restrictions, again, uh, I'm often asked about the use of land registry restrictions to protect overage. I'm often asked about local authorities using overage when they're selling land. The important point to note, as I'm going to mention before we finish, is overage is difficult, if not impossible, to protect. A restriction is not cast in stone. Restrictions can be disapplied, cancelled or modified on application. If you as a local authority impose a restriction on a registered title, it is imperative if anyone makes an inquiry of you with regard to that restriction that you react to it. If you simply do nothing, there is a danger that the person wanting to deal with the land will apply to the land registry to disapply, cancel or modify it. <clears throat> Be aware of exempt information status at the land registry. The land register is an open register, but you can ask if you're submitting commercially sensitive information to the land registry, be it in the form of an auction agreement, be it in the form of any documentation relating to a JV, uh, where someone is applying to register a lease where the local authority is a landlord, if it's commercially sensitive, you can ask the land registry by way of an application for exempt information status for the document to be treated as exempt information, meaning that no one can see the original. Someone is entitled to see a redacted version of the document, but you can ensure that commercially sensitive information is redacted. I've given you details in the notes as to what the land registry regard as being commercially sensitive. So if you're submitting an evidential document to the land registry that you think is commercially sensitive, you can ask the land registry for exempt information status, meaning that someone would only see the edited version of the document. <clears throat> 
if you're the landlord and the lease is commercially sensitive remember the tenant will be applying to register the lease in which case you would have to insist in the agreement for lease or in the lease itself that the tenant applied for exempt information status and of course remember exempt information status simply relates to the document you do need to think about um, com um, confidentiality and uh, uh, non-disclosure agreements etc with participants to agreements where commercially sensitive information is being submitted to the land registry and of course the opposite side of all of this is as it is an open register if you're dealing with a landowner if you're concerned about land adjacent to a local authority or what someone is doing relating to land you can see by application to the land registry cop copy option agreements etc that will give you an inkling as to what's happening with regard to land in the vicinity i want to before we finish talk about option agreements and uh, overage why would we have an option agreement as opposed to a conditional contract or a promotion agreement well the beauty of an option agreement is that we're creating an interest in land that can be protected conditional contracts are notoriously dangerous on the basis that if the condition is not correctly drafted then there isn't a valid exchange of contracts or at all and promotion agreements are fine in the context of what i mentioned earlier things like jvs etc or where there is development but there isn't any need to acquire a position in land with regard to an option agreement the agreement itself must comply with section 2 subsection 1 of the lord property act uh, miscellaneous provisions act 1989 do be careful with regard to trustees granting options of course the trustees are under an obligation to obtain the best price for the land in question and if you're entering into an option where ultimately you're only going to be paying 80 percent of market value then that automatically flags up a potential problem for trustees um mortgagees powers on sale include a power to grant an option as i mentioned and on unilateral exercise it is important to understand that the transfer or the document dealing with disposal of the land um, really uh, automatically sort of comes into play and i would maintain that the transfer should be annexed to the option agreement so that everyone is aware of precisely the terms that the land is to be transferred if the option is, to tri is triggered i mentioned that options are regarded as a special entitlement and uh, therefore it's important that we do look at the terms of the option agreement and we comply to the letter with how the option agreement is triggered and what is to happen thereafter option agreements if land is unregistered can be protected by a c4 land charge they can be protected by notice in the charges register if the land is registered and you should always think about protecting an option agreement with an agreed notice rather than a unilateral notice because unilateral notices are capable of being challenged and being removed the other important thing i think with regard to an option agreement is to understand and appreciate what the option agreement does it gives you as a local authority the right to trigger the option and acquire the land it as a consequence means that you should really be performing due diligence before the option agreement is entered into I've dealt with a few negligence claims over the years where there's been an option agreement to acquire land, the option has been triggered, due diligence is then performed and it then transpires that the land is not appropriate or suitable for the development that was intended. So all the expense of paying non-returnable option fees, all the legal work done with regard to entering into the option, triggering the option, etc., has been wasted. It's important to understand that if we simply have an option, then all we have within it is an obligation to transfer a good and marketable title from the uh, owner of the land to the buyer of the land if the option is triggered. Therefore, we do need to make sure that our option agreement contains all the terms that are necessary to ensure that the title that we are acquiring is good and marketable and is suitable for whatever purpose our optioner, the buyer, intends. When drafting option agreements, we need to think about the triggering event. Uh, we need to ensure the trigger event is sufficiently certain. 
I don't like trigger events that are a date calculated by reference to other dates. I don't like that generally in property documents. So I've seen situations where, for example, in a commercial lease, someone sent across to me this morning, there was an issue about when a rent review takes place because the date for the rent review was four years after the rent commencement date. But surprise, surprise, the lease did not have within it the date that is the rent commencement date. So then what do you do? Far better to always have a date specified or to make sure that if a triggering event is the obtaining of planning permission, that we specify what the planning permission is. I once dealt with a matter where the landowner applied for planning permission and that application was sufficient to, to compel the optioner to either exercise the option and acquire the land or back off because there was no provision within the option agreement specified who was to apply for planning permission. It was just a requirement that if a permission was sought that um, and if a permission was granted the option would have to be triggered. Purchase price might be market value, it might be market value minus, it might be market value plus. In the good old days when I was doing a lot of work for one national house builder, we would sometimes buy sites and we'd pay market value plus 10% because the chief executive of that company's attitude was I make money out of building houses, not buying land. And in order to get a reputation with landowners, in order to get a reputation with others, he would always pay above market value so that people wanted to do business with him rather than business with competitors. Uh, can an option agreement be assigned? If so, to whom? Does an option agreement contain provision for dispute resolution? And as a landowner, I might not want the optioner to have the ability to place an agreed notice on my title. So I might want to manage how the option agreement is protected. I might be perfectly happy with a unilateral notice being placed on the title, but not an agreed notice. With regard to options, be careful. They do cause problems where there are calculations or formula to identify land purchases, option fees, additional fees payable where an option is extended, etc. There are rafts and rafts of case law. If you are putting a formula or calculation in any document, be it a transfer, a contract or an option agreement, put a worked example within the document so that the courts and the parties are aware of what everyone intended when um, an option is triggered, when the calculation is required. I want to talk about overage and whenever I mention overage, my heart sort of sinks because the number of times over the years I've acted on behalf of landowners and I've got a land agent coming to see me with the client and the client is delighted on the basis that they're selling land. The land agent is absolutely delighted because in addition to getting market value for the land, he's also managed to secure overage. So in essence, the land agent has done his work, done his additional work, obtained a, a higher fee as a consequence and has now delivered some expectation in favour of the landowner that I'm going to sort of upset or I'm going to deflate. The problem with overage is, yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong with your getting a second bite of the cherry with regard to land values. So we're selling land as garden ground, we're selling it as agricultural land, we're selling it as a brownfield site. We don't know what the buyer might get by way of planning. We difficult, if not impossible, to assess what the land is actually worth. And therefore we sell at the price that we say that we're entitled to overage in the event of certain eventualities. Local authorities in particular are keen to utilize overage because we don't want to be selling land and uh, obtaining anything less than market value or selling land and then find out that developers have, ex have extracted huge amounts of profit that mean in essence local council taxpayers and others are very dissatisfied with the fact that we perhaps have not sold land at its proper worth or proper price. So let's just have a look at that for a moment or two and have a think about it. Okay, When might you consider overage? I think whenever you sell land particularly where you're selling land and it's impossible to assess market value. And that 
impossibility might arise because we don't know what sort of planning permission might be obtained for the site. It's contaminated, we don't know how much it's going to cost to decontaminate. The developer is undertaking a site assembly project and we don't know what other land he or she is acquiring, but where that additional land is acquired it might enhance the value of the land that we're selling to that particular developer. There might be issues or problems associated with title that can't as yet be resolved. There might be political uh, reasons for imposing overage. It might be that we are selling at a low value on the basis that we want land to be developed. So we want to make the land attractive to developers, but we don't want to sell at a low price such that the developer makes a fortune out of us as a consequence of that low price. So we might want to sell low and then in essence to share in the value of uplift when the developer works his or her magic. So that's really a, ki a situation where we might be looking at a JV but decide against it due to risk issues, for example. Um, where we're selling land with a potential for development, these days it can be particularly difficult to assess just what form of development can take place. I've also mentioned here, for those of you that do private client work or have done in the past or will do in the future, that I've used overage where we've distributed land to beneficiaries and we've been concerned about ensuring whether the land is of equal value or appropriate value. The reason that I mentioned that is I was once involved in a situation where a farmer um, in his will left the farm, which was a, a working mixed farm, to his wife and left a small field, a sort of pony paddock, to his mistress. Mistress hit the jackpot because that pony paddock was an access to a development site that was really wealthy. So you first looked at this and thought, well, the farmer's wife has done very well, she's got the farm. The reality was that the value of the farm paled into insignificance with regard to this potential ransom strip. And therefore, as a consequence of that, I've always sort of been advising uh, private client lawyers, just warn them about the dangers of distributing land to beneficiaries on the basis that what might appear to be a very valuable piece of land might not be because it's contaminated and what appears to be a very uh, non-consequential piece of land might have a huge value for some weird and wonderful purpose. But for our purposes, I've listed here when overage might be considered and the point I would make to you really is that you should always consider it, particularly as a local authority disposing of land. Moving on, if I can. When we're dealing with overage, a number of things. How long will overage last for? I'm currently dealing with a matter where the imposition of overage has blighted a really lovely development site. The landowner sold the land 10 years ago. The overage lasts for a period of 25 years. The original landowner wants 50% of the market value of the land as and when it's developed, with a, definite, a wide definition of what development means. Therefore, whoever buys that land is really going to say to themselves, it's uneconomic for us to develop it with that, uh, with that overage provision within it. You might be able to buy the overage out. You might have a landowner who has the benefit of overage that realises that it's better to be reasonable and sensible rather than holding out for 50% on the basis that 50% of nothing is, of course, nothing. When overage is being dealt with, we need to think about triggering events. We need to think about how overage payments are calculated. Again. Complicated calculations lead to problems, worked examples and simple calculations and formulas always work best. We need to think about how overage is going to be secured, more on that in a moment or two. And we need to think about practical problems. Again, last year I dealt with something where someone had uh, an overage clause imposed on them. They were hell-bent on developing the site, but the overage was paid as soon as they got planning. And the company didn't have enough money to pay the overage at that point. It would only have the money when it was actually selling houses. So what we did is we renegotiated when the overage payment was due. So it was paid uh, on the basis of a drip feed as and when each house was sold. Protection of overage is so important. Any overage provision that you as a local authority or county council impose needs to be protected. How can it be protected? There are two safe ways of protecting overage. One 
to instead of selling the freehold to a plot to sell the leasehold. Developers, of course, won't be happy with that, neither with their funders or the creation of a first legal charge. Again, that usually will cause practical problems. You could impose a second charge, but then insist that the developer notes an agreed maximum amount of security on any first charge. Positive covenants can be used, but there's an issue about enforceability. Restrictive covenants can be used, but there's a problem about application in the Section 84 of the Law Probably Act 1925 to remove, vary or change restrictive covenants. I have seen easements, rights of way over land, the retention of airspace over land to be used to protect overage. Again, arguable, but perhaps more protective than some of the other me methods that I mentioned. Ransom strips are a nightmare because of problems with boundary identification and because of inadequate mapping and also because some local authorities will compulsory purchase a ransom strip where a ransom strip is precluding development. In short, there isn't a safe way of protecting overage. The important point is to suggest to what your estates team the various methods of protecting overage and see what they have to say. To finish, because I'm conscious of time, no matter what we do, make sure we get clear instructions from our estates team. Make sure that we understand what our local authority objective is. Think about the bigger picture. Do proposals warrant tax advice for us or other participants in the scheme? Think about the practicalities of what we're doing with regard to a JV option agreements and overage and make sure our estates department understand the documentation that we're drafting and what we're doing. If anyone has any questions or queries, I'm happy to take them now, Stephen, if that's OK. Um, just bear with me. Um, or alternatively, I'm more than happy to do questions via way of email. I'll just put on slide there, if you can see that, my contact details and Robert's contact details as well. Stephen, we could spend a day talking about probably joint ventures and half a day talking about options and another half a day talking about overage, but uh, we've all got lives to lead and I'm very grateful <laughs> for people an hour this morning and I'm sure everyone's had more than enough of me droning so I'm going to finish are there any questions Stephen on, the, on your chat box at, at the moment we don't have any questions um Ian I'll leave that open for just 10 or 20 seconds there if anyone did have any questions you can just submit them in the the questions pane of the yeah. control panel but as Ian says if if you would like to ask a question offline I'm more than happy to to do that as well. Um, I think it is going to be quite quiet today on the questions front though, so perhaps we will wrap up if you're happy with that. Absolutely. Uh, Stephen, what I'll do, if anyone does ask questions of me directly, I'll share them with you and if you could share them with delegates, that would be brilliant. I think next week we're going to look at some issues with regard to business lease renewal, which is really interesting and I hope everyone can join me. Thank you very much, Stephen, for organising today, and you, Robert, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. It is much appreciated. Stay safe and uh, speak soon.